So, what's your name? Guy Davis is my name. Guy, um, we're here um, to discuss a very historic um, subject and topic. Lincoln School desegregation, elementary school desegregation in New Rochelle, New York, which happened to be the pivotal case after Brown versus Board of Ed for uh, integrating the school, public school system of the whole Northeast. How are you related to that in the history of New Rochelle? My family moved to New Rochelle in 1962. I was in the fifth grade. In the sixth grade, I started going to Mayflower Elementary School which was a few blocks over from what used to be Lincoln School. Uh, I should backtrack a little, say, uh, my parents, uh, that's going be R.C. Davis, Ruby D, were the residents who moved here. Now, they moved us out of Mount Vernon because they knew that opportunities in New Rochelle with education would be good, but they were aware of this thing called Lincoln School. And there's a big problem with it. I know they stopped it and run it, you know, broke it down in 1965. But I never got to go to that school. I never saw the inside of that school. Well, you went to school with people that had gone to school there and oh, yes. subsequently had been um, integrated into the rest of the school system of New Rochelle. What was that like in terms of socialization for you? In terms of socialization, I thought it was good. Mm -hmm. It was fun, it opened up a big door. Uh, a lot of the young men around here were very outgoing and extroverted, and they kind of helped me along in my sense of uh, extroversion. Uh, there was a late, uh, started going to, what, in 64, started going to Albert Leonard Junior High School, where I met a lady named Ann Williams. Now, she was a community activist as well as uh, an educator, and a department chairperson. Leslie Roberts here in the community. It took the desegregation of desegregation of Lincoln School to get these folks kind of mobilized in building that com this community up incrementally. What was the interracial tone at that time? Because you had um, quite a melting pot here because they were bedroom community of the United Nations. They were bedroom community of uh, Midtown Manhattan, and it it has its history. Uh, cultural tone of the school system? Well, in the school system, I don't recall anybody not being around. I saw there were a lot of Jewish kids, a lot of kids from uh, Italian and Irish extraction. Um, on occasions, there was, I can try to remember what it was, probably in the late 60s, there was some kind of racial issue going on. I remember my brother Eddie getting hit in the head with a pipe, some kind of thing. I don't I wasn't there for this whatever the come down was or battle. But um, usually people could fight. It was the North Avenue, uh, North Avenue Presbyterian Community Center. We had Westchester Young Actors Theater. We had uh, Ernie uh, the playwright. Well, I can't remember his name right now. He used to put on plays here in the community. Uh, I found myself being invited to the homes of people who were not necessarily African American. Who what were your, what were the what were the backgrounds of some of your friends? Backgrounds because you have music. Uh, what do you do right now? I am a musician. Yeah, pretty much traveling musician. And you've been all over the world. I have getting posted. I'm, paid for enough plane tickets to get all over the world. Uh, and you come from a, a performance family, but a socially conscious family. What do you think their ideas were um, following um, the integration of Nourishell, bringing their family here, and um, what were the expectations? Because I know they were also involved in the community. The only expectations I remember of my parents and myself and my two sisters were that we do well in school. We have 100% effort always get our homework done. This is public school. Now my folks were busy incrementally trying to move the community along. Um, they were aware that the uh, the railroads, I think it was Conrail back then, weren't right. integrated. You didn't have uh, black ticket takers and, uh, and engineers and such. So they actually uh, 
they decided not to pay their ticket one night on the way to work and got arrested. You know, a pro there's right. protest going right. on. Right. Pete Seeger came up in here. Right. Singer. So a uh, great folk singer yeah. and environmental activist. So numerous. I, let, I was at a show once in City Park, headlined by Cool and the Gang. Pete Seeger was the opening act. And you guys became uh, close oh, yeah, friends. We, yes, we and did. And your dad, dad and he worked together as well, didn't they? Yes, yes, yes indeed. Uh, so, uh, but you did crossover work with your music um, in, into rock and other genre, didn't you, while you were in school? Um, I think while I was in school, I wasn't so much playing music. Music sort of started out as my therapy. Okay. Uh, but as things went along, I got a band here in New Rochelle, which tried playing around. It was the, the great dancing artist Pearl Primus yeah. actually paid us one day to uh, be community entertainment right here in what is now Lincoln Park, uh, the site of where the school came down. Uh, there have been bands, but primarily I take my songwriting skills, my instrument skills, and I travel and play. Uh, somewhat in the mold of Pete Seeger, so yeah, I do cross a lot of boundaries that used to be around. In terms because of you grew up in a somewhat international community, to what extent did you, did you have interface with um, international people here? I know that the, I know that there were a lot of embassy um, children uh, when when at that. I think I had more interaction with embassy people and international people than I am even aware of. I, I'm aware that Jeffrey Benassa, I think was his name, uh, necessarily to the UN from West Africa, don't recall what country, lived here in New Rochelle. I, the Barnes and the Karandes, and I remember them, they, the Karandes were from Nigeria. And Pearl Primus moved into their house. Oh, okay. Yeah, mm -hmm. thanks Thanks for that reminder. And Jojo Barnes, Liberia, Joe Barnes. Okay, man, I know people who, who were from Liberia today, but I don't remember them from New Rochelle. Okay. But I did run into them growing up here. We'd be in the city, in and out of the city all the time. If you were talking to families and young people that are students in New Rochelle, what advice would you give them having grown up here? The advice I would give to any young person, students around here, tell your family's stories. And to make it educational, to record it, write it out as best you can, and take it to your teacher so she can help you correct the grammar and get the language straight. But tell your family stories and then find a, a forum where they can be shared, where Jewish people can talk about Passover to the uh, the Korean community, the black community, the Hispanic community, share stories, share food. Like Anthony Bourdain went around you know, with the food, go around with your stories and with food. What would you say to the six families and the 12 students that were part of the test case, Lincoln versus City of New Rochelle, what would you have to say to them in legacy right now? I could not tell you because I'm not especially aware of that test case. I was just aware of Lincoln School. But my parents, in a way, they allowed me to keep it peripheral. Because I had to stay up in the present tense. They wanted me to grow up just as a normal boy in a normal world. Uh, and that's hard to balance that against the sharp reality that is out there. Because mm -hmm. there are people standing in this well, you right actually, now who weren't granted that grace. But you actually went to jail with your dad over civil oh. disobedience. Tell us yes. about that. Okay. So you were active. Oh, well, okay, 1970, there was a student from overseas named Peter Manchester and myself in New Rochelle High School. We decided to do a draft board sitting at the Arnold Constable Building. <laughs> and, uh, well, we pulled it off. We talked to our teachers and to uh, our folks. So a lot of people joined us. And on this particular excursion, all we did was occupy the office. We did not destroy files or hurt, harm, or endanger any Nothing destructive. Any Nothing destructive. Yes. Even though the newspapers kind of made it sound like, you know, uh, it you know, could have gotten dangerous. Mm -hmm. We did this. And my father, myself, Peter Manchester, and a local reverend were arrested as a result of this. The rest, we, we were all given time to 
to go out, to clear out of the office, but the four of us remained behind. Mm -hmm. And uh, so I got to be in lockup under the police station over there. Hawthorne Harris uh, bailed us out, got us out of there. And apparently the entire matter in court was reduced to a violation fourth degree. I'm happy to say so. It, it got taken off the criminal law. Books. You happen to be uh, a student of Michael Schwerner's mom? Yes, Ann Schwerner. Tell us oh, about mom. Michael Schwerner and Michael, Sch Mrs. Schwerner. Okay. Ann Schwerner was the science teacher in New Rochelle High School. A very caring, graceful, loving woman. She did not do anything political. She didn't have a political chip on her shoulder in class, but she spoke clearly to us and frankly. If there was something going on in the community, she wouldn't mention it. But teaching science was her job, and that's what she did. And her son was one of the yeah, freedom riders. They call, they call riders. him Nicky Schwerner. You're one of the three. Um, Cheney Schwerner, Goodman. Yeah, uh, Goodman. Uh, yes, those three 